Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this morning, a public briefing on the subject of wearable technologies. Today, staff will present their preliminary research into wearable technologies. This emerging product area includes products ranging from fitness trackers to smart textiles and brain computer interfaces and carries a similarly wide range of potential hazards. Staff activity in the FY20 operating plan includes a newly added active voluntary standard in this area and a milestone report on safety issue with these products. We'll start with the staff's presentation followed by rounds of questions by the commissioners. I'll call on each commissioner in order of seniority. We'll start with five minute rounds but aim to be flexible and we'll go as many rounds as needed. Today we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Trey Thomas, Program Area Risk Manager for Chemicals, Nanotechnology and Emerging Materials. I want to see your business card. <laughs> And he is joined by Dwayne Boniface, Assistant Executive Director for Hazard Reduction and Analysis. Thank you so much for being here this morning, and you may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you to the Commission, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk about a very uh, exciting technology. So the, the title of our talk today is Wearable Technology, Overview of P Products, Potential Hazards, and Risks, and we will talk about uh, wearable technology and uh, what the, uh, the team within CPSC has been doing uh, to address the potential hazards. So when we talk about uh, wearable technology, uh, I think first we can start with just a basic understanding of where we are as far as uh, consumer products. This is a very exciting time for us. Uh, we're seeing significant changes in consumer products. You've heard, uh, for example, that we can now print out products through 3D printing. Uh, we have new and emerging materials, such as nanomaterials, that can be incorporated in the products. And we also uh, can see the evolution of electronics. If we recall, in past decades, uh, most of our electronic devices were, were remote from us. Uh, we had the, even the radio back in the 1930s and 40s was in the, somewhere in the living room, the television, even computers were large and in rooms. And now we're seeing that they're becoming smaller and more intimate to us. So we have laptops and tablets. Uh, we have uh, devices such as our cell phones and other devices that we'll talk about today that are literally worn on or in the body. So again, this is a very exciting time, but also challenging in terms of understanding these new technologies and the potential implications of them. So today, uh, we'll, we'll again talk about uh, wearable technology. We'll discuss what the staff is doing as far as categorization and, and hazard identification. Uh, we'll focus on jurisdiction and the next steps. So first, what is wearable technology? There are a number of definitions uh, uh, in, in the uh, electronic sphere, but one uh, definition would be technology that is worn on the human body. So basically it's technology or electronics that are worn on the human body. Staff has come, uh, developed a preliminary definition uh, of our own. Uh, it's basically uh, the same as the other definitions. However, we have expanded it uh, to include chemical, electronic, and magnetic uh, technology that's worn or applied or inserted uh, into the body. One of the interesting facets of uh, wearable technology is that it encompasses such a wide range of products, everything from clothing and textiles to watches to uh, game pieces that are worn on the head and on the body, which we'll talk about. So that's one of the challenges to understand this very broad range of uh, technologies, materials, and how do we make sense uh, of, of them. Also, wearable technology is growing very rapidly. Again, there are many uh, different estimates, but uh, it's expected for t uh, calendar year 2019 to be around $50 billion, and that's almost doubled since around 2014. So it is a very rapidly expanding and growing technology. Also uh, very popular is the Internet of Things, and although wearable is a separate category, it is connected. Most of the devices that we'll see have some type of connection either to the Internet or to another device uh, through Bluetooth or some other type of transmission. So uh, there is this connection uh, to the Internet of Things. 
So staff has uh, developed a classification scheme for wearable technology to try to, to make sense of this, again, broad universe of products, how we can address the hazards. So uh, many of the uh, uh, characteristics that we take into account are what type of product is it? Where is it placed on the body? What's the function and uh, what are some of the uh, foreseeable uses uh, of the product? And this classification scheme, uh, we include uh, five uh, categories, accessories, articles, embeds, patches, and inserts. And I'm going to quickly walk through uh, each category to give you a better idea of the types of products involved with wearable technology. So our first uh, category are accessories. And accessories are worn on the surface of the body. They typically are not attached uh, to the body. Examples are fitness trackers, which I think most of us are aware of, watch, watches, smart watches, bracelets, and rings. Uh, they have a number of functions. Primarily, the, uh, they involve uh, physiologic monitoring of the body. For example, the fitness tracker can track your heart rate. It also communicates and collects and stores data, so it may uh, interface with your phone or with a computer. And so that is also a, uh, a facet of, of the other uh, categories of products as well. Some of the other uh, interesting, and, and some of these are fully commercialized, others are prototypes, are warning devices. For example, there is a uh, device that you can wear to the beach, and it will warn you of sun exposure if you've exceeded a certain threshold. So uh, there are these types of devices. And as uh, uh, staff involved with chemicals, there are actually chemical monitors. Uh, and we will see this, for example, carbon monoxide. Uh, they're also used in uh, uh, external environmental uh, 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 air, and air pollution uh, chemistry as well. So uh, these are some uh, devices uh, that are quickly uh, proliferating on the market. Uh, one question about them is their accuracy. You know, how accurate are, are these measurements and uh, can they be relied upon uh, by the consumer? Uh, one other point, quick point, uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, perhaps a year ago had a uh, seminar on the citizen scientist and talked about, again, the greater use of these types of devices uh, among consumers. Also, some of the potential hazards, since they are on the body, are skin irritation. We are aware of uh, with uh, some products that they, uh, there are specific products that have been involved with irritation and other uh, hazards like thermal burns. Our next category are articles. So articles are typically uh, clothing and textiles. Again, uh, similar to uh, previous category, they wore, are worn on the body. The difference is they typically cover a larger surface area. Uh, examples, shirts, dresses, jackets, athletic gear, backpacks. Similar functions, again, they're, they're commonly used to monitor the body, heart rate, uh, neurological function. They also provide, uh, can provide some other uh, interesting uh, applications, including entertainment. Uh, some can play music. They have speakers. Uh, there are others that can change color, for example. You can control the color uh, of the clothing. Uh, we also have here listed an electronic hug. So, uh, for example, if you wanted to uh, send someone a hug, it provides that sensation. And I think that's another interesting uh, uh, facet of these, these products is that uh, many of them can provide sensations uh, to the body. Also communicate, uh, collect, and store data like the other categories. Uh, one particular uh, area of interest is the use in athletics. Uh, we know that there are professional sports teams that are using these types of products, both, uh, for example, shirts and pants to monitor the neurological function. It helps them in their uh, training. Uh, and athletic performance. They can also potentially be used to warn of, of safety issues. So for example, if you're on a, uh, playing on a football, and I'm talking more high school uh, and junior high, that uh, they may potentially be able to monitor and to warn if you exceed a certain threshold, like heat stress or trauma. So there are, there's great potential for these products. Again, not all of these, uh, all this potential has been fully commercialized. Our next two categories are very similar, patches and embeds. Uh, patches, of course, as the name implies, is uh, 
placed directly on the skin. Uh, embeds are typically under the skin. Uh, these are things like chips. Uh, they're actually circuits that can be placed on the surface of the skin, on the fingernails, and so forth. Uh, one interesting uh, application for these products is that they can be used uh, for access to buildings. Uh, just this morning, I had issues with my uh, PIV card, and so now there are literally companies that are using them either on the surface or as embeds for uh, employees to have access to buildings. Uh, they also can be used in amusement parks. If you pay for certain rides or certain sections, they can be used there, and certainly age-restricted activities such as in a bar. So quite a, a number of, uh, of potential applications uh, in, in addition to tracking and identification. One uh, concern uh, that we do have, obviously these are on the skin or under, under the surface, cuts, uh, bruises, burns, but also if it's under the skin, is there greater access to the uh, blood uh, circulatory system? Could there be systemic toxicity? Again, we're not aware of any issues at this time, but it is going to be important that these you know, materials uh, have a high level of purity if they are certainly under the skin. And finally, there are inserts. Uh, these are uh, products that are placed into the body. Uh, most of us are familiar with things like earbuds that we place into our ears uh, in order to amplify uh, sound. There are also products uh, like the smart mouth guard. And this is an interesting device. Uh, you can, it will monitor the saliva, the saliva chemistry, and uh, provide sort of a feedback on the health status of the body. Uh, it can also be used for head trauma. Uh, so if there is an impact, this can monitor that. So again, similar to some of the other products, that, that ability to be able to monitor trauma and provide feedback uh, in some way. And similar to the other products, again, the uh, potential irritation, and since it is in the mouth, maybe in, for example, the mouth, uh, is there a greater likelihood of ingestion of chemicals? So we'll move on and talk about the hazards and risks. One of the, since again, we're, we're talking about an a, a, a incredible range of products and, and potential uses, uh, how do we categorize the hazards? So uh, we are looking for hazard patterns and consequences. Uh, we're also uh, monitoring uh, potentially higher risk products. For example, are there children's products? And products that are used uh, on parts of the body, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides, that where the body is more sensitive. Uh, to injury. So there's a lot of information on these next couple of slides, but we purposely did that, I think, to demonstrate uh, the complexity in, in trying to understand the hazards. So uh, the first question is where on the body is this device located? Uh, is it on the arm, the leg? Uh, again, is it uh, on the areas of the body that perhaps are more sensitive and more susceptible to injury? Could they also uh, be removed easily or are they attached more permanently uh, to the body. Also the product function, we talked about the number, uh, some of the functions for these products, but it, it certainly it, it is a wide range of, of functions. Everything from uh, biomonitoring, which many of these products do, uh, chemical resistance, also electrical generation. Now we've not seen many of these products in the market, but there is this certainly, a, I think we could all agree that the um, potential for solar technology, having solar cells, also that would involve some type of energy storage, uh, some type of battery. So electrical uh, issues, uh, we talked about the monitoring and entertainment, and also the use of light, uh, light therapy, and, and as far as uh, using light in, in entertainment. And then finally, what are the specific hazards and exposures to those hazards? So we've talked about where it is on the body, uh, the function, but due to that function, what type of spe uh, specific exposures uh, could we potentially imagine? So electrical, chemical, uh, light uh, and combustion, and sound, uh, as well as thermal. Uh, so there are a number of hazards. It covers many of the hazard areas within the risk management group. And again, uh, it, there may be multiple hazards uh, from one uh, particular product. I'd like to focus on one area that the team uh, has been uh, focused on uh, are the, what we call the brain-computer interface products. We're seeing a number of products that are, are, have greater 
potential impact on the brain and neurological system. One is virtual reality. I, I don't know if everyone has played a virtual reality game. It is really uh, an intense uh, experience. Uh, you're literally uh, immersed in this three-dimensional reality. And given your immersion, you know, there are questions about uh, what impact does that have on the brain and the neurological system. Somewhat similar uh, is the augmented reality. Uh, that's where you're projecting images into our three-dimensional world. And so, for example, there are glasses that potentially can do that. So it's not as intense, but clearly it is changing your reality. Uh, there are also brain stimulation and monitoring products. So there are products that uh, eat, uh, purposely stimulate the brain, often through electrical current, uh, and they are uh, believed to improve uh, memory and cognitive function. This is exciting. We, we've seen uh, just a proliferation in, in uh, things like Alzheimer's and, and memory loss among the elderly, so that's, this could potentially be uh, something to help that population as well as improving memory and learning among younger, younger children. Uh, also, there are uh, brain... Uh, monitoring devices that actually monitor the uh, brain waves and can interpret those brain waves. And in fact, they are incorporated into games so that you can control the game through the mind. And there are some games uh, that uh, are available uh, at this time. And clearly, the potential risks. With this, uh, certainly if we're talking about direct brain stimulation, but more to the uh, cross-reality products like uh, virtual reality. Given this more immersive and intense experience, uh, what are the impacts that we mentioned, and particularly on developing minds and neurological systems of young children? Uh, there are other hazards as well. Since you are immersed, you don't see the three-dimensional world, and so you may run into objects, uh, literally. But again, uh, I, I want to be clear that uh, as far as the brain and neurological system, we have not had any incidents that I'm aware of, but uh, as we're exploring where the potential uh, issues may be. These are some beautiful graphics of some of these uh, products, uh, but I think they emphasize some of the uh, potential uses, we have a classroom, and I, I think that education and training is going to be a significant user uh, of these products. Uh, we've uh, talked to uh, some of our federal partners, and, and we'll touch on that more, who are using this, for example, uh, DOD in, in training uh, uh, their personnel. Uh, in the upper right is the, uh, the brain uh, uh, monitoring device, and in the lower right, uh, not only do you have with the virtual reality the eye, you know, the portion, the visible portion, but there are also some games that are developing sort of like a body suit so that you have uh, sensations. Uh, for example, if you're at the, the beach and uh, so visually you're in the beach setting, you might feel warmth uh, or the wind. So it does provide uh, an even greater level of immersion uh, in that VR experience. So next we'll move on to what staff is doing in regards to wearable technology. We do have an internal team, we do, and with, that's interdisciplinary. We've developed and maintained an internal database, and we currently have about 400 products in our internal database. Again, most of this is based on web searches. We have reports that have been written, internal reports by the staff as well as attending conferences and workshops. And that's really great to inter interact with the stakeholders, uh, to better understand commercialization, and what type of products do we see coming down the pike. Collaboration with stakeholders is critical. Uh, we uh, have been meeting regularly with the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, as well as NIOSH and NIST. Coming out of uh, one model for interaction has been nanotechnology, and many of the folks that are engaged uh, in wearables and 3D are coming out of the nanotechnology community. So there's already been these uh, connections, but we, uh, but particularly with FDA, we have been meeting regularly uh, with them and uh, discussing issues of, of function and jurisdiction. As well, we've also uh, interacted with uh, manufacturers and trade associations. 
Uh, we've had uh, manufacturers come in uh, for, for meetings. And we've also had global outreach. Uh, we've talked to our colleagues in Health Canada, EU. Uh, in particular, uh, we've met with the German uh, Bureau of Risk Assessment. Uh, excellent meeting. And it's, it's great to understand how their perspectives and how they align with ours. And in fact, they have many of the same questions and approaches that we have. So we'll talk briefly about jurisdiction again uh, and, and this dialogue with our uh, federal partners. Uh, jurisdiction is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's not much, unfortunately, we can say broadly, but uh, if it's based on claims, based on function, uh, based on potential risks, uh, that's going to impact uh, the jurisdiction. Uh, for example, uh, there are uh, devices that repel, that act as insect repellents. So uh, we would think that that would likely be uh, regulated under FIFRA uh, by the EPA. So as far as jurisdiction and uh, requirements, uh, we, we also need to consider how our existing regulations may impact or apply uh, to these new products. For example, we've mentioned textiles, the Flammable Fabrics Act, or FFA, or chemical exposure, the FHSA, and even some of the products that may not be under our jurisdiction, like these drug delivery, but under the PPPA, is there, is there some jurisdiction there? So again, these are questions. Another issue that comes up in IoT and is very interesting is that typically we focus on the product itself. But part of this technology is the fact that these uh, products have uh, algorithms, uh, programs, apps associated with their function. So if, how do we deal with that and not just the physical product, but the algorithm, especially if the failure of this algorithm or, or misunderstanding of it, if it can impact the safety of that product. So that's a, a new factor that we, we need to address with these new products. And finally, the uh, path forward. Uh, what is it that we as a team think we need to do as we move forward. Uh, clearly to continue to identify the hazards within each product group, uh, to identify, uh, to understand the market and uh, quantifying the risk to consumers. Also voluntary standards are gonna play a very important role uh, in, in, in addressing the potential implications of these products. Uh, we've begun to engage in uh, the volu voluntary standards activities and uh, again, that's going to be critical for addressing these issues. So in summary, uh, wearable technology is a, is a rapidly evolving landscape. Uh, the regulatory jurisdictions, there are going to be questions, but again, that's going to be uh, handled on a case-by-case -case basis. We're working to understand these technologies, uh, to organize them into categories, to understand uh, their potential hazards. And as always, it's important for manufacturers and other stakeholders, uh, many people use that term risk governance, that we're all in it together and we all have to do our role to ensure that these products are evaluated and that there uh, any potential uh, hazards or risks can be uh, adequately addressed. So I want to end by thanking uh, the, the, the staff. Uh, we've had a, so much hard work uh, come from the uh, from the wearable technology team as well as the PARMS. Uh, it has truly been a, a great, and I think, fun effort in, again, tr uh, understanding this, this area and uh, learning more about it. So with that, I'll be happy to take questions. So thank you very much. Uh, absolutely fascinating presentation, uh, and you've got a wonderful team that's doing a lot of incredibly interesting work. Uh, so this always brings me back to... Uh, a thought I have, and that is, I think it's important that we be uh, ahead of the curve in terms of addressing emerging technologies. I always worry at times about the shiny object, about what's she, she, au courant, state of the art, cutting edge, capturing our, capturing our attention when we still have fundamental risks that we got to address. So here, here's a tough philosophical question, if I might. Uh, on a scale from one to 10, if at this point you were to rank where you think wearable technologies fit in terms of risks that we should be concerned about, could you give it a number and could you give a reason for that number? Why? Uh, I didn't mean to hit you with anything too heavy. <laughs> you know, it's difficult. Because you, you've been do it dealing with nano and that was, that's another area where I've had that similar kind of question. 
I, I can uh, help Dr. Thomas a bit. I, I think this is one of the areas. We've certainly seen uh, existing hazards with these products. Uh, they have been fortunate at the minor scale. I think our intent uh, in this area is to try, I think as you know, to get ahead of the curve, uh, work with the standards development organizations to sort of head off those hazards. And I think what we have here is an opportunity to do just that. We can work with the, the community in that area and keep this out of the 9, 10 range and keep it uh, down at a, a, a less concerning level. Uh, thank you. Let me return to planet Earth, if I might, and I'm sorry to hit you with such a heavy question. Uh, one of my ongoing concerns, and you touched on it, is uh, with respect to elderly and senior citizens. Um, do you see a whole area of uh, products coming out that would uh, not only protect seniors in terms of warnings, but also uh, be affirmative things that would help them, uh, maybe anti-fall devices or anything like that? Is that... Uh, is that something that has captured your attention? I, I think so, uh, absolutely. I think in terms of, uh, we've mentioned biomonitoring, and so it can help understand what's going on with the body. Also, even the brain function, you know. Uh, so I think overall, and one thing I did not mention is uh, with some of these products, for example, there's clothing, that even if you're stressed, uh, it can send a message to a loved one, uh, and they, uh, one particular manufacturer had a commercial where someone stressed uh, the the uh, article of clothing, sent it to their loved one, and they after called it gave it, you a hug, right? <laughs> after it gave you a hug, but uh, it wore them. So although that's that's lighter than what you're asking, but certainly yes, uh, it can they can also uh, contact a physician uh, and other medical personnel. So I think that is really an important and I think very uh, exciting part that can really help people. Uh, so monitoring that. Uh, as well as the therapy, again, not our jurisdiction, but I think, you know, more the therapeutic uh, aspects as well. And oftentimes they're combined. So, yeah, I, I think it's important to really think about, uh, you know, the potential uh, benefits to the, the consumer from this technology. Yeah, and I also love the fact that you've reached out to other agencies because jurisdiction is going to be so fluid and so flexible and overlapping at times. And so this also popped in my mind. We had a terrific and have a terrific task force on nanotechnology. Is there any move in addition to IoT uh, federal task forces to have one dedicated to this, or will this probably be just a subchapter or a subpart of the IoT federal task force? Well, actually, there is a nano sensors group, and I, you know, we participate in that. So, again, mu much of the nano community, because they're looking at ways to apply nanotechnology to sensors to miniaturize them so they can be incorporated into clothing and, and the rings and other devices. So, yes, that is ongoing. Uh, we participate in that, and uh, again, it, it, that, that sort of model of interagency collaboration and sharing of data. Is, is, is going not only from this area, but to 3D and to wearables. So that's certainly exciting. And I'm gonna to touch just a little bit on your earlier question. I think one of the lessons that we learned about nano, and I was there from, from pretty much the beginning, there were a lot of concerns, but I think through interagency collaboration and coordination, we've been able to address a lot of those issues. The sky was not falling, the gray goo was not gonna destroy us. So I think that we have been able with good, robust science and research, be able to address those questions. So I think that that provides us with a good model for again, interagency collaboration, as well as the ability to address the implications and risks, as well as one other thing too, I think for stakeholders, to change the paradigm. It's not the government coming after you, but we're working with you. We want to de responsibly develop this technology. So it's, it's good, so your R&D, you're getting the scientists, the material scientists, the R&D developer, and the toxicologist at the table. I don't know how successful we've been, but I do think that there has been that shift in thinking so that we think about health and safety from the very beginning and not when you're about to commercialize. Well, thank you. My time's up, but you're the perfect person to address that issue. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, and to the rest of the team uh, for great work. Just excellent, excellent work. 
I wanted to dig into some of the areas that you were just talking about, specifically starting with the collaboration outside of the United States. And you mentioned talking to one of the member states in the European Commission, the Germans. I was curious, at the Commission level, the European Commission level, though, have there been a lot of discussions or any discussions with our staff and the European Commission staff about how they see this issue? With the wearables, not as much at the commission staff, uh, commission level, but certainly, as I mentioned, at the state level, uh, again, Germans being one of the largest markets. So we're starting there, but we anticipate expanding that more. And I think, uh, you know, to the earlier question of, of collaboration, I think many of the uh, same group, same staff that was involved in nano mm -hmm. is also looking at some of these other emerging issues so i do anticipate more more uh, collaboration with i the see EU. and was when during the nni initiative was the how much collaboration was there with the commission itself the european commission itself oh there's an extraordinary amount uh we have uh what's called the us eu communities of research and it's just been extraordinary um collaborative effort we have annual meetings uh, we the and this is where researchers from the European from Europe and and the U.S. but even government but it's it's, it's focused uh, quite a bit on the research community, and we've seen uh, uh, projects uh, come out of this collaborations even CPSC funded work that uh, that that has really pushed the science forward and the health and safety. So again, we we look to that as a paradigm for interaction with the EU. That's great to hear. Looking forward to more of that. Um, you talked about industry collaboration and the goal absolutely being to build safety and on the front end. Obviously, we've spent a lot of time on that over the years. And one of the things that we've discovered is that a lot of the time, and particularly with startups, they're so busy trying to stay funded, get funded, get their idea, uh, the proof of concept to be effective, that they're often just not aware of safety issues. And so what have you all been able to do to try to bridge that gap more so that in particular as these small startups that are often funded in incubators or by Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneurs to, to really reach them so that safety is built in on the front end? Well, I think in attendance with meetings, there's been you know, personal conversations. We look at, we anticipate participating more perhaps providing uh, talks on CPSC. Unfortunately, when we go out, a lot of people are not aware of, mm -hmm. of CPSC. So I think part of that is going to involve you know, more understanding who we are, our jurisdiction, and reaching out. Again, the voluntary standards, I think, is one way to do that. But I think attendance at these conferences, particularly when you find, as you said, a lot of these are small startups. Some are even in graduate school. So they just aren't aware of the regulatory landscape. But I will say one final thing. Uh, it was great. There is one conference I do attend regularly. And finally, they did have a, uh, at least one speaker talk about the need to understand regulation. So well, that's we good. are moving forward, but there are certainly things that we can do to outreach more with these, uh, with through the conferences. And, and, and that uh, speaker was not a CPSC employee. No, was that for somebody not. else? <laughs> no. That's good. And in terms of, so the work that you've outlined and toward the end of the slides that the staff is doing, that's all currently funded work, correct? It, yes. And so is there additional, and if you and your team had additional funds, would you be able to do more or some of it just cannot be done sooner because the time is just not ripe to spend that money. I'm trying to understand that if the commission were to provide more funds through the mid-year, for instance, would that make a difference in terms of the pace of the staff's work? I, I can help out a bit. I think one of the uh, uh, one of the challenges we have in this area, given where we're at in the uh, dialogue, particularly with standards development organizations, our limit is at this stage the, the human capital and not the, the fiscal capital that we can uh, uh, leverage through the mid-year process. Meaning we need more people? I, I think we're limited by the number of people we have here. So this is, I think, as uh, uh, Acting Chair noted earlier, we have to balance this work mm -hmm, sure, with other uh, uh, hazards that we're working with. And, and so we have, uh, we have to make that adjudication. Got it. And then on the people front, Mr. Boniface, since you're responding to that, do we feel, and we obviously have a great team. We know we have a great team, but do we have the depth of expertise that we feel that we need in light of these issues that have been identified? 
Uh, I think that we have an outstanding team. I, I'm truly, uh, truly blessed with this team. I think uh, couldn't be prouder with them. But I do think that we have uh, deep capabilities, and I think the commission in the operating plan uh, identified a path for us to bring in uh, external help, and so we are actively pursuing that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Biacco. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas and uh, Mr. Boniface. This is a fabulous presentation. It's as exciting as it is scary to me. Um, the one thing, a couple things that jumped out at me. I, I do agree with you, Dr. Thomas, on the voluntary standards front. In fact, um, often when I'm speaking to uh, different conferences, that is the one thing that is consistent throughout my remarks uh, to uh, those organizations or entities that are uh, leading the way through technology. And I tell them all the time, get in front of this. Get a voluntary standard in place. You know what the safety pitfalls are. Um, so address them first. So I do think that's a good way to start. But the, that leads me to my second, um, uh, second question or comment um, and probably my biggest concern, and that is the definition here and the jurisdiction and how we divide this up. Um, I was looking at the, the definition in your slides, and I understand this is a working definition. Yes. Um, I, I, I wanted to know why um, you included chemical um, I was trying to get an idea, and you helped me along through the um, presentation, get an idea of where the chemicals come into wearables. Um, but that made me think how many of these wearables really are more medical devices as opposed to consumer goods. Well, I think the chemicals specifically, for example, there are products that will change color, but it's more of a chemical reaction rather than computers, so we oh, incorporated that. So okay. it might react to the atmosphere, it might react to your body heat, or so I, I think we wanted to include those products. It's more of a reaction rather than the actual actual having a chemical in it. Right, yes, okay. it's, it's a reaction. That brings me back to the hugs. That's gonna bring us <laughs> to a whole new level of employment law, <laughs> sending <laughs> hugs to each other. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on a, the, you mentioned that uh, trying to divide up the um, uh, jurisdiction uh, was on a case-by-case -case basis. Is there any way at this juncture for the agencies, because I can see you know, one of the products you were talking about uh, talks about, um, you were talking about reliability and it tells us you know, X or Y or sun exposure and whether that sun exposure it's telling us is actually correct. That made me think, gosh, there's FTC issues here, there's FCC issues here, there's FDA issues issues here, not to mention CPSC. And I wonder if it would um, help to try to divide up um, the products uh, and start putting them into uh, appropriate jurisdictional categories so that we know, we know what our core function is going to be as opposed to it could be this or it could be that. Um, and I know the term wearables is, is very broad. Um, uh, but you know, when we're talking about brain activity and, and Alzheimer's and things like that, I wonder if that's more appropriately dealt with at the FDA as opposed to the CPSC. Well, the team has tried to do that, and I think part of our uh, meetings with the FDA is to, is to do just that. Are there areas that we can exclude that are clearly ours? Um, and again, I, the jurisdictional issues, clearly I will defer to general counsel. But I think we have tried to do that. Uh, but it's difficult, and I think that uh, there is, it's really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think as much as we can to try to carve out what's ours and, and what is not, uh, I certainly will we'll attempt to do that. Okay. Um, I, I've been reading a lot about um, performance fabrics um, with minerals uh, in them or silver, uh, silver threads or electronic threads that you can actually scan and it'll give you some feedback on performance or whether the product is authentic or not. Um, are, are we, when I look at the definition of wearable mm -hmm. technology, I'm not sure whether or not our um, working definition captured that. Am, am I missing that or is that something that we haven't addressed yet or is it too new? You know, it's a working definition, sure. and and I think that you know we're trying our best to try to capture just starting out what is it. So it's going to evolve over time. You know, as you're saying, there's so many new pro there's so many new products coming online, and we're trying to make sure that that definition and it will change. I'm sure over time, and it's something that we've just used somewhat internally for our team purposes. But I think as you know, as we all move forward, I think that we'll update these definitions, and and also I think looking as we look to our federal partners, how they define it, as well as the industry. So I think it's just an evolving process. 
I, and I wrote down here, do we have a list of specific um, examples? Um, and I think you said we do. We have about 400 products captured. I'd, I'd love to see what that is. Mm -hmm. And if we could highlight maybe uh, which of those are the children's products would be of particular interest. Um, I, would, I would love to see that because I can't even think of 400 different products um, <laughs> that would be wearable, if you will. But thank you very much. My time is up. It was just excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Acting Chairman Adler, and, and thank you, Dr. Thomas and Mr. Boniface, for uh, the presentation and the work that you put into this. Um, I think that this is a product segment that's incredibly exciting, and you've done a good job today discussing some of the potential and currently realized benefits that wearables have to offer. Um, as CPSC determines what its posture is going to be with respect to wearables, um, or for that matter, all emerging technology, including IoT and 3D printing, like we discussed a couple weeks ago, it's my view that it should do so with an eye not only to our safety mission uh, to protect consumers from unreasonable risks of injury and our statutory obligations, but also with an eye towards preserving innovation and keeping barriers to entry low, um, that the benefits that you've discussed aren't actually going to be realized if firms are regulated out of existence um, or the barriers to entry to the market are so high that consumers aren't able to take advantage of some of the exciting things that this technology currently has and will potentially have to offer uh, in, in the future. Um, but to that point, what is CPSC currently doing and what more can we do uh, to make sure that this product segment remains vibrant and competitive? Well, again, I think ensuring that products are safe. I, I think the last thing we want is for something to be recalled. So I think that, as we've mentioned, you know, reaching out to manufacturers, making them aware, not just CPSC, but all of the federal partners, making sure that they are aware that, uh, you know, that, the, that regulations exist, the voluntary standards exist, and that they participate. I mentioned earlier when I was at this wearables meeting and there was this uh, presentation on regulation. Again, we're talking about, in, in many cases, grad students, uh, very small people that just have put a lot of work, use credit cards to pay for research, and they want to get it on the market. So I think that outreach to them, that you have to consider uh, health and safety, not just the regulator going after you, but it's good for your product. You don't want to invest the time and effort, and then it harms someone. It's just not good for anyone. So I think that has been the message and so we'll continue to dialogue and, and work in all of these sectors, voluntary standards, communicating with industry through conferences and other things uh, to get that message out. Great. And with respect to voluntary standards, can you talk a little bit more about what your and staff's role has been and, and will be in the future with respect to SDOs? Well, I think two things. One, to participate. Uh, we also are looking for ways that perhaps we can suggest voluntary standards for product categories. So I think that's where this categorization is so important. What should we focus on and could we, depending on the appropriate voluntary standards organization, perhaps recommend that there be some activity? Great. I, I hope that moving forward we can continue the dialogue so that the commission can actually work to help direct that conversation um, in, in a way that's that's useful and meets all of the, the, the objectives that we're talking about today. Um, you mentioned that there's a bit of a crossover between nanotechnology and wearables, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if for no other reason than it's a lot of the agency staff that had been previously tasked with, uh, with working on nanotech that's now sort of feeling its way into uh, uh, the, the, the wearable sector. Um, with nanotech, that was a, a significant agency expenditure. Um, it focused uh, 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 fairly heavily on, on hypothetical risks that weren't necessarily ultimately realized. Um, I, I'm wondering that in your experience, um, are there any lessons learned from nanotech that may be applicable to the current discussion about wearables? Well, I think, you know, again, we having the interagency collaboration and, and more importantly, the stakeholder outreach. I think Nana was unique. We had a coordination office that not only brought the agencies together, but also this, all of the stakeholders, the industry, academia, as well as the NGOs. So I think that in many ways, and, and we're in a ref, kind of reflective time, it's been 15 years since the NNI, but I think 
in many ways, and, and I've been involved in it, there, there is a victory there that, that we have addressed. It wasn't as hazardous as perhaps we thought in some instances. And again, keep in mind, nano is, is continuing, continuing to evolve uh, new materials and so forth. But I think what was good is that we were able to address the environmental health and safety issues. I remember in the mid-2000s, there was a scathing report that was uh, published on CPSC and our ability and other agencies to address this. And they just said it's too complex. We have been able through robust research and uh, working with our, not only our federal partners, but academia and others to address it. So I think the lesson learned is that you know, we are able to, to, to identify what those uh, issues are. Uh, with NANO, we had a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, strategy document for health and safety, and we were able to understand what the agency roles were. Very good. My time's expired. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, thank you. And I just have one or two uh, questions and maybe a comment. I did want to pick up on what Commissioner Feldman and also Commissioner Biacco were saying about voluntary standards. I think developments here happen so quickly that the idea of having mandatory standards written is probably a, a big challenge and one I hope we never face. Uh, so if we're going to rely on voluntary standards uh, and the only fallback from a voluntary standard that fails, uh, aside from a long laborious process to doing a mandatory standard, is a recall. And I hope we don't reach either of those concerns. But that does lead me to say, and I do want to underscore the need for us to be proactive, and I was pleased to hear you say that we're not only participating, but we're also suggesting, and I would urge you uh, and the voluntary standards folks to continue to do that. Um, I guess one quick question, uh, and this is always an issue when it comes to chemicals, for example, because we do worry about the acute hazards, but then there's always the chronic hazard that's lurking. Are we thinking about chronic hazard concerns as much as we're thinking about acute hazard concerns, and have we identified anything uh, that seems to be a particular area of, of chronic challenge that uh, may not exist in the acute world? For chronic, not at this time. We have had some issues with the acute hazards. So, but I think that goes into what we've described in this stepwise process of understanding the technology, understanding the types of materials that are being used. I think one facet of this is the people are going from nano to quote unquote advanced or emerging materials. So it's an evolving site. So I think part of our challenge and that my own program, you know, has changed. Uh, and longer to to reflect that. So I think that part of our job is to definitely understand what are the overall hazards, both acute and chronic. And I think uh, also when we talked about our categorization scheme, not only where it's on the body, but how long is it, per let's say, permanently attached. If so, then we have to be concerned more about uh, chronic hazards, or even if it's not, but it's used, you know, regularly and number of hours used. For example, the virtual gaming. You know, are there materials there? So I think that's the, the thinking and the rationale that we have. And I think, again, those are the lessons learned from Nano, that, you know, how do we approach understanding new, certainly from the chemical, and Nano as a quote-unquote chemical, how do we understand and, and is there a met methodology to understanding it, th these hazards? So I think we have a good model to use. Uh, thank you. I have no further questions at this time. Commissioner Kay? None. Thanks again to the staff for a great job. Thank you. Commissioner Biacco? Um, I, I have one thing. I, I love your point about um, reaching out to the grad students and starting that thought process about uh, safety uh, with them. I, I do know, um, I, I have actually, actually been looking at this myself, I do know Penn State um, has a, a, an advanced, uh, for, in their master's program for uh, their engineers, an advanced course that they give in the summer, which is you know the law and what they're doing, particularly in additive manufacturing. And, and I would suspect that that could be extended. Uh, I have spoken with one professor there and just chatted with him about what's in the course now and what he could add uh, if he wanted to consider it. And I, I'm thinking that that might be something that we toss around a little bit and maybe have a, uh, a, a cheat sheet, if you will, or a checklist that we want to make sure gets out there on, on the very basics as these programs are being developed, the companies are being you know, funded, and the students are learning their trade. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did, God, did you have... No, I, and I hate going back, keep going back to nano, but I, I, I do think that that's one of the things that we do have through the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office, webinars, 
and I, they've been very effective in uh, reaching out to the stakeholders, particularly the academics, and understanding the safe use of these materials. So again, it is a good paradigm, and and you know they can be archived. So even if you can't watch them live, you know you can go back to them and even have training programs. So I, I think there's a lot of talk about that. You mentioned centers, and that's another thing. Another thing too, if there are centers of excellence, centers of research, to target those and to say, is this part of your curriculum that helped in safety? So again, it's part of that changing of the paradigm that we get to the grad students, not just for emerging and but just overall that you must consider safety you know, as, you're, uh, as you're developing any type of product. It should be automatic. It should be part of the development, the whole developmental process. Absolutely. Well, let's keep that dialogue um, going because I'm very interested in that and maybe we can come up with something. Okay. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Uh, I definitely want to keep this dialogue going um, and I just want to circle back to something that you said uh, and, and Commissioner Biacco said and I don't remember Probably Commissioner Kay agrees, but I don't want to speak for him, uh, which is just how important the, the, the voluntary standards process here uh, is and, and, and will be in the future. Um, I, when we were uh, meeting to discuss the, uh, the, the operating plan for 2020, uh, we, we took a specific look at uh, the voluntary standards development for emerging technologies, and I think that would include uh, what would include wearables and, and, and IoT. Um, and the, the, the way it exists right now, it, it, it calls for, uh, you know, a significant amount of commission involvement in, in, in sort of direction to staff about uh, figuring out what the, what, what the best path forward is and what that participation should look like. Uh, so I do hope that we continue this conversation and, and that we continue the conversation amongst the four of us uh, to, to direct that staff participation in a way that, that maximizes all the benefits and, and uh, risk mitigation that, that we've been talking about today. Um, last question, and, and this is uh, echoing something that Commissioner Biacco brought up. Um, when you put together the classifications, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, you did a good job of outlining sort of what considerations you, you put into that. But as you're surveilling the market right now and looking at products that are coming online, does it make sense to, um, to, to think about a, a separate and distinct classification for children's products? That's the way the agency handles um, children's products with, with respect to uh, uh, other market segmentations. Well, we have in a way, I think when we talked about the brain stimulation devices and, and the VR, that's part of, because children typically will use many of these games, I think that's part of that effort uh, as, as well as, you know, again, that's a good suggestion. I think with all these categories, are there specific children's products? So we can, you know, look at them as, as a subcategory. Right, or, or, or maybe, maybe in addition, uh, infant and toddler products, can you talk a little bit about what, what you're seeing in the marketplace? Those, uh, we're seeing some, the monitoring type products, and I think one of the questions is whether they uh, are under our, because some of them are therapeutic. For example, there's a blanket that uses light therapy, so there are questions on these jurisdictional issues. But we certainly have seen them, and again, a lot of them are therapeutic, monitoring type devices. Okay. Again, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting and exciting conversation. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Feldman. And of course, along with worrying about the vulnerable population of children, let's not forget the seniors in the elderly. Absolutely not. Uh, I want to make sure that the commissioners have asked all the questions they've asked, so may I see if there's any additional comment question? If not, uh, Dr. Thomas and Mr. Boniface, we can't thank you enough for a superb presentation. You really got our brains working this morning without any excess or external stimulation. <laughs> I want to thank the wonderful staff sitting behind you who have done such terrific work yes. on this project. Uh, we can't thank you enough for this. And therefore, this concludes a public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank everyone. Thank you.